Greetings from uh, Ottawa, Canada. We're here uh, recording a few days in advance as I will not be available this Sunday. Um, our message today is going to be from Second Peter starting in verse 3 of chapter 3. Let's pray as we ask the Holy Spirit to direct us. Father God, we ask now that you would guide us in what we do here today, that you would receive all the glory and honor, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting in verse 3, Let's see what um, Peter is trying to tell the people in the church here in the uh, Mediterranean world. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. The word here, mockers, and I'm using the uh, word book of the New Testament. Um, the word here, mockers, specifically speaks to scoffers, people who would scoff at truth and, and, and make light of the truth. And that's what uh, Peter is dealing with here again. He is reminding his um, readers that I've already discussed these things with you, and he did in chapter uh, 2. And the same word here that we read mockers or scoffers in the King James mockers in the New American Standard is a similar word used by Jude in verse 18 of his writing. These people are just looking for anything wrong with Bible truth. And they follow after their own lusts. Their only thing that they're really interested in is what would promote them and make them more important than God's word. These are false teachers that Peter has already brought up on charges, you might say, in the previous chapter. And all they do is make um, fun of or make light of God's word. They don't take it seriously and they make it to be something that isn't truth. And one of the things that has been immemorial in the church, it was immemorial as well in Israel. I've been reading through the Chronicles and in Exodus and it seems that it doesn't matter even with God manifesting himself right in front of, uh, uh, of Moses who would then manifest himself in front of the people of Israel. Still they complained and they weren't happy with even the food that they were given to eat. There was always something wrong. Jesus came and he fed 5,000 and when he came they came again saying feed us again and he said well I'll give you something else you can eat and they did not like what he said and they again abandoned him. Uh, it, it speaks to the human condition who do not take the things of God seriously. Look at verse 4 says and this is how uh, uh, they take these things to the place of, uh, of uh, maybe making people to think that there's nothing important that can be found in God's word. Look what they say, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Now, Peter has written this book only about 35 or so years after Jesus has been crucified, buried, resurrected, appearing to his disciples and many others over a period of 40 days and eventually ascending to heaven. And he said, I'm going to come back for you. And so here we are 35 years or so later and they're saying, so where is he? You can say the same thing today in the year 2019. So where is he? You know how many times I've had people say that to me? And my response to them, to them is simply this. When it's time, he will come. But people don't want to wait on God's time. And people who are scoffers or mockers or however you want to label them as, they are unbelievers and they are problems within a body of believers if they happen to be even within your church. They are problems even perhaps in your neighborhood if they're people who um, do not hold to biblical truth. But then remember that if they are in your neighborhood and they are mocking you for your faith and your beliefs, Remember, that is to be seen almost as a blessing, if not almost, it is a blessing. To find yourself in a situation where you are, uh, you might say, cursed by the world for your faith in Christ. All that God asks and hopes from you is that you would persevere and carry on. Press on, as Paul told the Philippian believers, to that higher calling in Jesus. They're saying, where is the promise of his coming? Well, we are in the last days, as Peter makes note of to us in verse 3, and his coming is imminent. 
his coming for the church to have a, to draw us up to meet him in the sky, in the air, in in the premillennial, pre-tribulational rapture of the church. It could happen at any moment. Are you ready to meet him? And when that happens, we will just simply be taken out of this world. You won't have to be concerned about it. If you are a believer in Jesus, if you've been born again, if you've accepted his son as personal savior, then you have the absolute assurance of knowing that you will spend your eternity with God and he is coming to get you. We may be here for some difficult moments in biblical time, uh, difficult times as well, biblical times. Well, it is biblical, but it does not mean that God is forgotten. And if God is omniscient, all-knowing, he has not forgotten. If God is omnipotent, all-powerful, he has not forgotten. If God is omnipresent, then he knows where you and I are even right now at this moment. And so he has not forgotten you. He is coming. These people say, for ever since the fathers fell asleep. So there perhaps is some con uh, connection here to um, the Jewish community because he's referring to the fathers of the, the Hebrew scriptures, perhaps, or maybe the fathers of the early church. And some at this point have fallen asleep. To fall asleep means to go to your grave. Everything continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. But they're mocking creation. Nothing has changed. Everything's the same as since the beginning of time. Where's God in all of this? God has never disappeared. Man has just turned his back on God and gone in his own direction. Look at verse 5 then. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. God spoke and he created. In Genesis chapter 1, you read, I think it is 14 times that God spoke and he made uh, the world from nothing simply by speaking. Now, how can anybody, anything, speak and create from nothing? Well, it's God who did that. And because it was God who did that, it is God who will culminate all of time at the end of time. And when that happens, this is when people will realize that it has nothing has changed from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. Long ago, God had created the heavens and the earth, and it existed, and the world was formed from nothing by God. Look at verse 6, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Now, I think it's very interesting here that Peter makes his connection to creation, to these mockers, scoffers of the church. He makes this, cre uh, this connection to creation and making it very clear that it's God who created. But he's talking here now in verse 6 about what will happen to those who continue to mock God. It'll be judgment. The world was destroyed by a flood. You read that account between Genesis chapter 6 and 9. It's the Noah account, the flood account. You'll get people in uh, the church today who will make light of the fact that there was a worldwide flood. Some say, no, no, it, it wasn't worldwide. It was, it was localized to just one small section of the world. Well, when God says world, it's world. And he only made one world. And he made one globe. And however it was at that time of creation, how he made it, he flooded it to destroy the human condition, you might say, off the face of it, except for Noah and his family. Uh, Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And through his three sons, the, fa the family of Noah, the whole earth was repopulated. And it was through the, the lineage of Shem one of Noah's sons, that the Shemitic, the Semitic peoples came through. And through Shem to Eber to Abraham to Judah, Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to the tribe of Judah to King David to Jesus. And it's all connected. And God judged the world and God took away the evil as much as, he, as had to be taken away at that time in history. 
and it's like the world started again. It didn't deal entirely with the whole sin condition because sin started up almost right away after that as well. But the bottom line is that God is making it very clear through Peter's writing here that these people can mock. These people can find all kinds of things wrong with the people who hold to faith, who believe in God, but that God will judge them. If he judged the world in a flood, he is going to judge these same mockers in these last days. Now, what are the last days? Since Jesus ascended to heaven, we have been in the last days. The countdown, you might say, to the time when Jesus will eventually come for his church. And sometime after that, begin the judgment that will be as we read in the book of Revelation. Verse 7 is where we're going to finish for today. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. In verse 6, he makes a reference back to the flood and the judgment that he brought then. In verse 7, he's talking now, and Peter's looking way down the corridor of time, past the events of the book of Revelation, past the 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth, past the final rebellion when Satan is loosed one last time. Read that from chapters 19, 20, 21, 22 of the book of Revelation. And you see we get to the place where God destroys or renovates this whole planet Earth that we're living on now as he protects us and those born as believers during the thousand-year reign of Christ. Um, and he renovates or burns up with fire and gives us a new heaven a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. That comes after the events that are described in verse 7. But the point that Peter is trying to make here is that these false teachers will be judged. God does not sit back and watch and just let it happen. God will judge. What do you want to see happen in your life? You don't want to be judged the way that God will judge this world. Because when he judges, it's final. As I told people in Montreal last Sunday, I'm going to mention it here again. There is one place that's been set aside for those who are followers of Jesus, and that's heaven. And God doesn't care where you come from. He doesn't care if you're Jewish or Gentile. He cares where you're going. He wants his people of the house of Israel to recognize their Messiah, who is Jesus. He wants all nation peoples to recognize the Messiah who came first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, who is Jesus, but also came for all other people. And he wants you to come to him because there is a coming judgment. And that's something you do not want to be part of. So Peter concludes these um, five verses simply by saying in a similar way if God created the heavens and the earth by simply uttering his word he's going to judge the present heavens know what it says the present heavens and earth they're being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men so where do you want to spend your eternity do you want to be part of the ungodly men who are like these mockers here? Or do you want to spend your eternity with God in heaven? There's only one way to do that, and that is to make a profession of faith in who Jesus is. And it's simple. All you need to do is acknowledge the fact that you are a sinner, that you'll never earn your own way to heaven, and that God has a place for you and he's done all the work of making you just and righteous before other, before him. It's not a matter of who it is before others. It's a matter of before him. You need to be born again as the scriptures describe in John chapter 3. You need to ask Jesus to come within you, cleanse you of your sin, ask to get that brand new start again. If you need information on this or you have questions about it we'd be happy to talk to you about it 
you can go to our website, www.ihopecanada.org, and you can find ways to communicate with us there. You can go to any of our Facebook community pages listed as Israel's Hope Ministries. It's a discussion group, Israel's Hope Bible Church, or just Israel's Hope Ministries. And you can communicate with us there. Or you can write to us at Israel's Hope Canada, Box 47031, Blackburn Post Office, Ottawa, Ontario, K1B5P9. If you want to use the internet, you can email at info at ihopecanada.org. We'll be back next time as we continue on in the book of Second Peter and conclude our studies in there. Until then, we say shalom. <laughs>